was such good timing that we were able to get Professor David Bow to come to the event um, during your uh, extensive tour in Europe. Um, obviously, Professor David Bowd is based at the University of Technology in Sydney um, and has been uh, since 2007 an Australian Learning and Teaching Council Senior Fellow, extensively involved um, in the area of assessment and within the pack, as well as a copy of the slides he'll be using this morning, um, is a a leaflet about Assessments 2020, which I'm sure he'll be referring to. So, um, without further ado, we're already running slightly behind time, um, but I'm certain that um, David here will uh, foster our learning and thinking around assessment, and uh, the title is The New Assessment Agenda. So, thank you very much. I invite David to make his address. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, Chris. I'm very pleased to be here. Um, I think it's my first time in the University of Salford. Um, what I was reflecting on sitting down there as I was waiting um, for us to kind of get going was why would a group of otherwise sane and rational university teachers be spending a day on this ridiculous topic of assessment and feedback after you'd just been doing all this marking? You know, it's like, you know, are, are you really sane and rational? Um, and I'd like to suggest that maybe you are. Um, and one of the reasons why that might be a really good thing to be spending our time on is, is something which, in a sense, adds to what Hugh was saying about the reasons for thinking about assessment, to something absolutely central, fundamental to what we do. And that is... There is nothing more powerful in influencing what our students do and how they do it and what they learn than what we do in assessment and feedback. Nothing. Nothing's more important. Doesn't matter what your lectures are, doesn't matter what's in your course. What is the most powerful influence on our students is how we assess them. And our assessment tells our students what we really care about. And if you don't really care about what's in your assessment, you've bloody well got to change it right now because that's what you're doing. You're portraying what you think students should really know, what is non-negotiable in the way in which you assess them. So that means that it's something particularly significant, particularly pivotal. So what I want to do in this presentation is just to... Um, explore this whole issue of assessment, suggest that it's actually rather problematic and maybe it's let us down in the way we're thinking about it so far, and to uh, follow this trajectory. So I want to suggest that some of the existing ways in which we think about assessment now in universities in Australia and the UK is very problematic and that we need to rethink what assessment is and how we do it. And strangely, that rethinking might not change some of the really best practices that we do, but it will invariably influence some of the other practices, which may even be the majority. So I want to start to that, raising that question. I also want to peer into the future and to think about what kind of graduates do we want to produce? And I want to suggest that we need both initial and continuing practitioners that can learn and can regenerate when we're not there, when there is no course, when there is no assessment externally on them. That is what we're trying to produce. And the question is, is our assessment creating that kind of graduate now? I want then to go on and suggest that the problem we've got is not a shortage of assessment methods, of assessment practices, of different ways of doing things. They are coming out of our ears. There is a kind of enormous array of things we can do in assessment that we can draw upon. And we're seeing a little bit here today, we're seeing some good examples today. But if you look beyond that, and it doesn't take much looking, very, very easy to find an enormous panoply 
of assessment practices. That is not the problem. That is not the problem at all. I want to suggest that the problem is the way we've conceptualised assessment is fundamentally counterproductive to learning. So we need to change our assessment thinking and the practices that go with that. And the thing I particularly uh, have been working on in the last kind of couple of years is it's all very well for us to get assessment to work for learning now, but really we've got to get it to work in the longer term. And I have my doubts about some of the things that we take for granted in the ways in which we do things, that rather than actually build students' capacity to be learners in the longer term, it disables them. It actually pulls the carpet from under them. It infantilises them in worrying ways. And I want to see if we can find a way of looking at assessment that isn't the process of infantilising students. And of course, there's a lot of implications for what we might do. So where shall we start? OK. I think assessment as we know it, commonly, has failed us as educators us as educators, us as people that are interested in having an influence on student learning and building student learning in desirable ways. And I think what it tends to do is to drive compliance, not initiative. It fosters dependency by learners on assessors and on being assessed. It sets things up that gets our students to look to someone else to judge them. I can't tell how well I'm doing, tell me. This is a fundamentally dependent situation. Would someone in the workplace be saying that to their supervisor? I think not if they want to keep their job. So how we created this situation? So I think what we're doing is that we are set up assessment so that it's backward looking it looks at what has been achieved rather than not, than not on what is needed to be achieved. So we've got a retrospective view of assessment that's always looking back. Have you got it? Is it under your belt? Can you reproduce it? Rather than building capacity. And what I think it tends to do is it makes our students fearful rather than building their capacity and it depletes it rather than building it. And, of course, you might want to question me on some of this, and I'd be terribly disappointed if you didn't want to question me very robustly on some of this, but I'm wondering how we reached this state. Why have we taken our eye off the ball of assessment for so long? Collectively, that is. There's many of you in the audience that have not taken your eye off the ball, I want to reassure you, but a lot of us have. I've just come from a conference in Spain, an international conference there, and one of the papers was about a research study on assessment conducted in one of the prize-winning departments in Finland at the University of Helsinki. This was uh, a department of international renown, or national renown rather, in teaching and learning, won all sorts of prizes, all sorts of wonderful things. And this study was done of the assessment practices there. And they were, and the conceptions that the staff had were quite impoverished, shall we say very underdeveloped and it makes me think if someone some department that's got such a reputation can in a sense fail to rethink assessment how much more could be done if we took up the assessment challenge as well so one of the uh, one of the issues we've got is this fixation on certification and this is a domination by other people's agendas our profession is we're professional educators. Our business is in supporting learning fundamentally and primarily. We're also in, in institutions that, that credit and certify. And of course we need to take account of that. But as educators we need to keep our, our eye on assessment. And it's continually being distracted. One of the things I say in Australia is that there's probably one thing that's guaranteed to get your vice-chancellor on the front page of the newspaper, and that is some dodgy practice in certifying students. And in my own state, 
I can actually identify three vice chancellors from three different universities that managed to get themselves on the front page of the newspaper because of things like dodgy marking, plagiarism, and the issues that haven't been done well. And what this engenders is it engenders a, a, a sense in senior management, of course, Hugh is you know, new to this, so he's completely innocent of any kind of <laughs> concern about this. Senior management is completely and totally obsessed with the public image of assessment and certification. And their own anxiety sometimes, very occasionally of course, trickles down and provokes us to be anxious about this aspect of assessment. And what it has tended to do over the years is it means that we are being more and more dominated by assessment and a fixation on certification, the certification end of assessment. And it creates distortions in our practice. It changes what we do. And it changes where we apply our energy. And one of the questions I sometimes ask a, a group is, how is your effort distributed across the semester on assessment matters? Is it mostly, is it kind of fairly evenly distributed? If you add, all to, add together all the things you do that are assessment related, is it fairly evenly distributed across the semester? Or does it tend to kind of um, bulk up a bit towards the end? Or more commonly, does it have a, like a, an early peak or mid peak and then a big peak at the end? Now, I'm not going to embarrass you by asking you to declare, but I want to suggest that if you've got the peak at the end, you've been taken over by a certification view of assessment. And I suggest that maybe your energies aren't being applied in quite the most appropriate way for learning. We've also got this fixation on measurement. And we've got this measurement metaphor. Some people even have this belief that assessment is measurement. Assessment as measurement is a fairly recent phenomena. It only really came in in the 70s. It was influenced by the, what you might call the, the so-called scientific revolution in assessment, in which people um, from uh, basically a, a psychometric um, persuasion looked at the strange folk practices that were going on in assessment and said, have we got a solution for you? Okay. And what we can do is that we can take your weird folk practices and make them scientific. And we've got a nice vocabulary you can use, and it uses words like reliability and validity. And, well, it used to use the word discrimination, but we, <laughs> we mean something else by that now. Um, and we've got some technologies to go with it. We've got this wonderful thing, which is the multiple choice test. Although then, it wasn't called the multiple choice test, it was called the objective test. And this introduced the metaphor of measurement, and it's been very influential in what we do. And it is, measurement is a metaphor. What we're doing in assessment is fundamentally judging students, not measuring them. There is, a, there is obviously, an element of measurement, but if we let that measurement metaphor become too dominant, we privilege things which are not important, and I'll come back to that. And of course we know that acts of measurement influence what's being measured, particularly when we've got sort of active human beings that are subject to this. And that feeds back into what students do and what they regard as important. OK, well that's the past a bit. Let's look into the future. You've probably come across this hundreds of times now. Of course the future's unknown, and of course it is intrinsically unknowable to us. Intrinsically unknowable. And that unknowability creates both constraints on what we do and how we prepare our students, and creates possibilities as well. And the thing that we have to accept is that new knowledge, skills and dispositions will be required by our students that cannot possibly be learned now or even known of now. We are preparing our students for a changing world. 
And unfortunately, the pace of change is not decreasing. So whatever else we do as educators, we've got to prepare students to cope with the unknown and build their capacity to learn when the props of a course are withdrawn. So how do we think about that? How can we get our head around assessment in a context in which some of the knowledge to be assessed, not only the knowledge, but some of the knowledge to be assessed, isn't actually known to us yet? This creates an interesting dilemma. So what does that imply for what we do and how we assess it? I want to suggest that we, we need to think very clearly about assessment and collectively it feels like we've got rocks in our head when we talk about assessment. One illustration is that we use the word assessment to mean two different things. And not only are they different, they are almost sometimes contradictory. So, what we have is we have the notion of assessment for certification. And when we do assessment for certification, when do we do it? When's the best time to have assessment for certification if certification is about declaring what a student can do when they leave us? It's at the end. It's at the end. If you want to do good assessment for certification purposes, we should defer it as late as possible. <clears throat> Why would anyone outside here have any interest in what a student did in the first part of their first year? Or the first part of their second year? Or in fact anything until they're formed as a part of our course? Why, why would we kind of record that? Of what interest is that to the world? You know, maybe, you know, the, the, this is of interest that a student took lots and lots of attempts to get there. But what people that want to employ graduates are interested in is what can they do now? not what they could have done, by and large, by and large, not exclusively, but let's get our priorities right. For certification, we want an accurate representation of the graduate as graduated. As far as learning is concerned, is that a good time to assess students for learning purposes? Well, of course not, that's absurd, because you know, the learning goes up until that period. If we're going to do assessment for learning, we need to do it early. And not just early in the overall programme, but early in the semester. I want to suggest that it's almost a complete waste of time giving students information on tasks that they don't complete till the end of the semester and on which they're not going to have an opportunity to do anything directly again thereafter. I think it's almost a complete waste of our time we should be deploying that time in more useful ways for learning. That is by finding ways of providing them with useful information when there's still an opportunity for them to do something useful with it. So we've got this tension about timing in our two uses of assessment. There's another tension we've got in these two uses of assessment and that is what detail of information do we provide? Now, for certification purposes, broad brush information is fine. Headline information, big headline information is okay. You know, is this student, well, you mentioned, is, is this a person of 2-1 who's going to get on a shortlist for, for jobs? You know, at a broad level, grading is fine for certification purposes. Is grading useful to help students learn? No, it is completely worthless. I'm, I'm slightly overstating it, but I'm going to say it again. It's completely worthless. Why? What information does getting a B or getting a 70 or getting a, a B minus, whatever, provide to students in terms of how could they do it differently? When, they've got, when they meet a situation like this again, what information content does that grade have? It's got tiny information content, not zero, but tiny. It isn't actually going to help students to do anything better next time around. So for learning purposes, students need information <coughs> that will enable them 
to change what they do so they can do it more effectively when, when they're in that situation again. So we've got this second tension between our different purposes of assessment. But we've still got one word, assessment, one word, and we're using it in these very different ways. It'd be nice for me to say, be able to say to you that there's a nice solution here, a nice elegant solution. But there isn't an elegant solution. There is a messy dilemma. And we have to live every day with that messy dilemma of the tension between these two fundamentally different uses of one word assessment. And it doesn't really improve things by calling one formative assessment and the other one summative assessment. It doesn't really make that much difference. Because we don't exist in a world in which we can, we've got the luxury of doing these things over here which are nice formative things, and these things over here which are summative things. You know? These things have been collapsed. And we've um, trained our students, and our students have pressured, pressured us to collapse the two together. <clears throat> in some courses, so I'm told, students won't get out of bed unless there's a grade involved. Yeah. Now, it's partly them and not partly us. So, where are we at the moment? I think we're in... Well, the purpose of this slide is to present the whole history of assessment in like two minutes. It's quite difficult. But the point I'm trying to make here is that assessment isn't the same now as it was in the past and it won't be the same in the future. Assessment is a changing endeavour. We have what you might call conventional assessment that was basically testing what you taught. Very unreflective, very kind of taken for granted. Well, it's just what teachers did. Teachers taught things and then they tested have students got it or not. That's conventional assessment. Um, no technology with it, very little conceptualisation. And it's the kind of, in a sense, the baseline from where we've all come. We then had this educational measurement revolution in the 70s and, well, in a lot of places it didn't hit till the 80s. Um, you know, where we had the wonderful, the fetish of the normal distribution. I actually worked in an institution that when I first moved there in the, uh, the late 70s, the Department of Psychology was so enamoured of this normal distribution that they, in every single subject, in the whole degree, they found it necessary to file a certain percentage of their students because of the, the fetishization of the normal curve. And it took, I don't know, 20 years eventually from when that came in to when they got rid of that. Um, process. We've gone through that, uh, and, and don't get me wrong, I think some of that, that, that kind of clarity of thinking that the measurement people brought in was fine, it's just that we needed some more thinking than the, one, than the thinking they did. Where we are at the moment is that we've got to focus on competence, um, and I always have to be careful what I say about competence because it means different things in different places and different countries. Um, a more holistic version of competence, shall we say. Um, the vocational education competence is not what I'm referring to here. We've got an emphasis on authentic tasks. The idea that we should engage our students with things that have got a whiff of reality about them. The students sense that, ah, yeah, I could imagine this is something that real people do in this area, rather than some strange task that is only referred to other things that you ever find in educational programmes. So there's a move towards authenticity. And there's a move towards um, what we call in Australia graduate attributes, um, transferable skills, key skills. Uh, I'm not sure quite what the current terminology here is. Um, and how do we assess these? And there's a lot of work going on uh, back home on, the, uh, on these uh, graduate attributes. So that, that's, that's the kind of... We're grappling with these things at the moment. And we're grappling with um, things like... Um, constructive alignment and things like that. So that's where things are at at the moment, um, an assessment. And what I want to suggest that we're moving towards is a notion of assessment that is about building students' capacity to make judgments about their work. And alongside that, building our capacity for us to make judgments 
about students' work so we can help inform their judgments. Will students act on the basis of how we assess them? No, they will not. They will act and they will change what they do on the basis of their judgments about what we say. They're thinking people. And they won't just say, take what we say, they're gonna take out, out what we say and then judge it themselves again. And how do we, in our assessment, build students' capacity to make good judgments about their work? Move on, to, come on to that later. So what are the shifts we've seen in assessment so far? And I think it's fair to say that in the, um, the first decade of the 21st century, we've probably seen more um, activity in, and change on the assessment front in higher education than we've ever seen in the whole history of higher education. This is a rapidly moving area. And it isn't just rapidly moving because universities in the UK are getting crummy results on the National Student Survey on assessment and feedback. It's even more important than that. I know this is shocking to say, it's even more important than that. But it is more important than that. So the shifts we've had so far is we move from a teacher-centred approach, well, we just teach what I taught, to a learning-centred approach, what has been learned. We've moved from a notion of testing knowledge, which is a narrow range of outcomes, to judging outcomes, and that's a wider range of the things that we want graduates to be able to do, students to be able to do. We've moved from the notion of assessing subjects to judging professional capability. And we've moved, not fully moved in all these directions, moved from the idea of testing students to the notion of producing learners. And this is an important one. We call our students into existence as learners by the way in which we assess them. We create our students by our assessment practices. And if we don't like the students that we create, a lot of that is due to what we've done in the way in which we've formed them through assessment. And indeed, it's not fully our responsibility in higher education, and indeed how they've been formed in assessment earlier in their careers. So, where we are at the moment, we're moving to a situation in which assessment is based on explicit standards. And I can tell you there's some scary things going on in the world out there. The OECD countries have got a project at the moment in which they're developing international standards for each discipline area, in which there will be an international standard, not just the subject benchmarks you've got in the UK, an international standard in each major discipline area. Um, and there will be tests for testing that. And these things are being developed in a project right now. And each OECD country is trialling two of the discipline areas. I'm not sure which ones are in, they are in the UK, um, but there are two being trialled here as we speak. So the notion of standards is, is, is going to kind of... Assessing against standards is going to become a more dominant feature of the agenda, although it is on the agenda at the moment. We've got, as I mentioned before, the notion of constructive alignment, which is, um, I would suggest, bread and butter. It's like... Every course on assessment for university teachers talks about constructive alignment appropriately. We've got on our agenda at the moment well-timed, high-quality feedback to students, and we're still struggling to work out how to do that well, but it's absolutely on our agenda. And we've got this notion of assessment and graduate attributes. That's where we are now. Now, you might think that's quite enough. That's quite enough to digest. But we'll come to a new agenda a little later. There's nothing wrong with this agenda, in my view. Um, there's an issue about how we interpret some of these things, and particularly how we interpret the standards thing, but that's, that's a kind of another point. So we've got these two purposes of assessment that I talked about, the notion of certifying achievement and aiding learning, that we typically call summative and formative assessment. Um, I want to suggest that we need to add a third purpose on, onto our agenda, not because it is intrinsically different from 
formative assessment, intrinsically different, but by recognising it as a separate purpose, we can actually pay due attention to it. And it's what the purpose is fostering lifelong learning, um, learning beyond graduation, and I've coined the term sustainable assessment for that. And by sustainable, sustainable assessment, I mean assessment that meets the needs of the present without compromising the ability of students to meet their own future learning needs. You can see I've pinched that from the sustainability development people. Um, but what does that say? It says that we need assessment that meets whatever the requirement is now, and that might be a certification purpose, or it might be giving useful information to students about how they're doing now. We need to do that. But also we need to do that in such a way that it doesn't compromise the ability to develop and build the capacity for longer term learning. And I want to suggest that some of our assessment practices do inhibit that. And we need to be thinking about every act of assessment as building, no matter in how small a way, building students' capacity to make judgments about their work. So this is not a matter of adding a bit of self-assessment as if it was a kind of a bit of salt you add to a sauce. He's regarding that as a fundamental purpose of what we're doing when we assess. Now that's sustainability as far as students are concerned, but I know when, when, when I talk about this, people are saying, well, yeah, but it's not sustainable for me because I'm getting frazzled by the amount of work I've got to do. So yes, it needs to be sustainable for us. And I don't believe that any of the things that I'm saying today require us to increase our assessment workload. They do not. They do, however, have substantial implications for how we redistribute our assessment workload. Very important implications for that. And I think we need to move a lot of our energies away from the certification purpose and we need to worry about certification only in so far as it means that we can justify our marks to a more substantial emphasis on assessment for learning and building students' capacity for making judgments. And that means shifting our energies away from end of module activities to more mid module activities. And that might mean doing things that at the moment we don't think is assessment, but I think is assessment. It's clearly formative assessment. Uh, just go over this. So I want to end up on focus on this assessment for longer term learning and look at some of its features. So I've mentioned already that it needs to be sustainable and it needs to look beyond the immediate context, avoid independency and focus on higher order knowledge and skills. And I want to provocatively say that we should never ever test memorisation. Not because memorisation isn't a useful thing to be able to do, and not because it isn't very important in many contexts, but it is so easy to assess. And students have had so much experience throughout their careers as learners that they have got into the very, very bad habit of approaching assessment tasks as if you could just memorise stuff and that was enough. We've got to wean students away from the expectation that they can do well in assessment by memorisation, by not focusing on that and by saying to students that you, you can do well in these tasks without having to memorise a lot of stuff. Unless, of course, the memorising stuff is essential, but then we don't assess the memorisation as such, we assess what that means in context in a real task. Second feature of um, reconceptualising assessment for longer term learning is to focus on this developing informed judgement. This for me is completely non-negotiable. Students must develop the capacity to make judgments about their own learning in every single module, in every single course, wherever. Because unless they can do that, they are going to be lousy students now and lousy learners in the future. It's basic, absolutely basic. And we need to be thinking 
getting our antenna tuned to thinking about how we do that. And it isn't just what we do in assessment, it's what we do in every single interaction we have with students. So assessment, I want to position as informing students' own judgments as well as, make, as, well as making judgments on their work. And one of the implications of this is that we've got to do that across a program. It's no good, I, I, I spend a long time um, doing research on self and peer assessment practices, you know, over a very long period of time indeed. And I can tell you one thing, they're all very nice, you know, you can get quite good results, but they add up to bugger all, right, at the end of the day. Because all they are is typically one person in one unit doing one interesting thing. What's the overall impact on the student? Not a lot. So we've got to think about this agenda in terms of building across programs, not just adding nice little bits and pieces here and there, and preferably not too much of it. Thank you very much. We need to, what I suggest we can call is constructing reflexive learners. And that is learners that are thinking about being learners. In fact, one of the things that we have to do when they come here as first years is that we have to kind of engage in this transformation. We actually have to take these students and turn them into learners. What do I mean by that? Well, as students, they've got this role as student. They've got a card and they've got the identity. I'm a student. Yeah. But that doesn't equip them to be a learner. To be a learner, they've actually got to see themselves as active contributors to their learning. We cannot learn them. We cannot learn them. Only they can learn. And the only way they will be able to learn is through active engagement. Not sitting there passively like puddings. Yeah. We've got to find some way of actively engaging them, but also to shift their identity so that they see what learning is about, is about being a player and not being a recipient. And in this, students must necessarily be involved in assessment, not because it's a nice idea, not because it's democratic, not because of any of that, but because they need to know how it works. They need to be able to apply these processes to their own learning. They need to know that they need to identify what constitutes good work of a particular kind. And they need to go and find out where they can, they can look to where they can find that. Yeah. Just giving students criteria, just telling them the standards, doesn't get anywhere. That only makes sense if you already have that way of thinking. We need to engage students in understanding what the st standards are, how they come about, how they can apply them, how they can identify them. So we need to position students who see themselves as learners who are proactive and generative. So sessions like this actually give me the willies because you know, all I can tell that's going on in terms of activity in the room is a little bit of nodding of the heads and a bit of shuffling and, and all that. And with students, I would never do this. So, and we also need to do this throughout the programme in every aspect of the course, not just on assessment tasks. Um, I've been completely sold on the notion of clickers. I used to be quite opposed to clickers. I'm completely sold on it because in very large classes it gives students a way of being active. And, uh, and there's a way in which we can easily engage students um, when we've got a lot of them. Finally, a conceptual a reconceptualise of assessment needs a notion of forming the beginning practitioner. And this doesn't matter whether it's a vocational course or not. All of our students are going to be practitioners of something or other. So I suggest that we need to think about assessment in terms of how do we help students calibrate their own judgment. It's more important that a student or a learner knows what they know and knows what they don't know than knows anything in particular. We're at a point in the history of the world in which it's easier than ever, ever before to know more stuff, to get hold of more stuff. That's not the issue. The issue is knowing what we know and knowing what we don't know and be able to organise this stuff. 
And to do that, I suggest we need assessment practices that give students practice in calibrating their own judgment. So for example, I'll give you an illustration. With my own students, I get them to go through a process in which they um, submit along with their work um, an account of the extent to which they believe that work meets a set of what you might call standards that we've agreed earlier in the semester. When I give students comments, do I comment on what is good and on what is bad? No, I don't. What I comment on is where there's a discrepancy between their judgment of what is good and their work. And that's where I focus in because I want to calibrate their judgment. I want them to know that they've overestimated themselves in terms of doing this and underestimated themselves on doing this. That, I think, is good use of my time. That means I don't have a kind of a scattergun approach in the information I provide. I need to home in on the information that's going to have most effect. We need to have assessment that builds confidence and skills. And, and one of the things that I skipped over on that slide about other effects of assessment is that assessment has devastating emotional effects. People are embarrassed, humiliated, uh, put down, all that. And it doesn't matter how good they are. You know, if, if, you, if you do these exercises with, with, with academics, they give you these wonderful stories of awfulness of assessment in their lives. Uh, and just think how much, so much more awful it would be for our weaker students. And finally, we need to think about assessment as developing the capacity to work effectively with others. We've positioned assessment in educational institutions generally as an exclusively individualistic act. We only assess individuals. In the world outside, people don't do things exclusively as individuals. They are judged in more collective ways on many occasions. So we need students to have practice in assessing with and for other people and in those contexts. And of course, I don't mean just adding bits of group assessment in. That's as silly as adding bits of self-assessment in, you know, and hope we can build these, these capacities. So, quickly move on. You're going to say, well, yeah, yeah, but where are the resources for this? This is the website that I developed as part of my senior fellowship with the ALTC. Um, the address, which I, I'm not sure I've written on the slides, assessmentfutures.com. Simple, assessmentfutures.com. And this gives a whole lot of the conceptualization, a whole lot of practice, gives lots and lots of uh, illustrations of how you do various things across a range of different disciplines. And it leads us to what we might regard as the new agenda for assessment in higher education. It's got to build on our existing one. It's, it's in continuity with that. But it focuses on the impact of assessment on learning as an essential assessment characteristic. Is reliability the most important thing we have to worry about? Is it? Is validity the most important thing we have to worry about? Is it? I don't think so. The most important thing we have to worry about is the effect that each one of our assessment practices has on what students do, how they study and what they learn. When we're confident that we have an assessment practice that leads students to devote their time in productive ways, then we can start to worry about these other things. But until we can be assured that they're doing the right thing, then the other things are mere luxuries. So let's get our priorities on that. We need to position students as active learners, always. We need to develop their capacity to make judgments about learning, including the other others, and this will help build learning and assessment skills beyond the course. So, is this what we're producing? So, I think I will leave you at that point. Thank you. Thank you very much, David. That was uh, really thought-provoking and clearly uh, leads us to uh, really question some of the practices that we have and to, to really think about how, 
how we engage learners and get them thinking about their learning in particular, um, which I wholeheartedly support you in that view. I'm conscious that um, it would be lovely to have the luxury of taking time to ask David questions, but David's around for the day, so I hope um, you might get a chance to speak to him if you do have any particular questions, because I'm conscious that we're already over time into the next sessions and we need to move on. So thank you very much again, David, for coming along today. A really thought-provoking talk. Um, and now we'll move to the seminar rooms for the round tables. Thank you.